How is everyone doing? Strength Chats episode 104. And today I have got two very special guests for you. Today I'm joined by the head coach and founder of Speedworks Training, Jonas Dodu, and Speedworks coach, Matt Cook. How are you both doing? Good morning. Good morning. We're all good. I'm all good. Yeah, very well. Thank you. Spot on. Um, what have you both been up to lately? What's been, what's been happening in your world? Um, for me, I've just got back from a training camp in Dubai with, with my athletes um, and come straight into the Six Nations. Um, so the guys, um, I missed the first week of prep, but uh, now I'm in midweek with, the, with, the, with England rugby. Oh, nice. Uh, trying our best to get these guys fast and happy and healthy. Nice. I thought you sounded a little bit cold coming back from uh, coming back. From <laughs> yeah, Dubai. exactly, <laughs> exactly. Come back from Dubai into Storm Kiara. Or, <laughs> or, I, don't, I don't know how to say her name. I don't want to piss her off, so I won't say. It. <laughs> yeah, don't make her worse. <laughs> yeah. uh, Matt, what's been happening with you? What's been going on? Um, I've been busy with um, a girl, um, Courtney Hill, who's just going off to play for um, Sydney Roosters. So we've been doing quite a pretty sort of intensive camp. Um, and then just had some visits from some some rugby league boys, um, which is starting to which is starting to pick up a little bit. So um, that's really positive, and and sort of same thing as Jonas, really, just trying to help them move a little bit better and get a bit faster and just understand speed a bit more. Nice. Um, so for everyone listening who might not know your backgrounds or um, what you're actually involved with in terms of you know the the coaching that you do, do you both want to just give a little bit of a background to yourselves? Um, okay, so my, my background is that I came from rugby, playing rugby and learning and trying to be a rugby SNC fitness coach or so, something of that elk. Um, realized I needed to know more about speed and power and, and, and running rehab. So I studied great track and field coaches and, and actually fell in love with track and field and ended up uh, coaching uh, for British Athletics and coaching two boys from the age of 16 or 17 until they were, when I have still, I still have one of them now, but essentially they both end up being sub 10 runners and world, world ranked and um, making finals and getting medals and doing all those, those great things um, at international stage. Um, and then alongside that, I've always worked in team sports. So um, my, my background has always come from a uh, focus on how do I encourage people to be more healthy in their movement patterns? How do I, um, efficiently uh, design programs that both increase performance and, and robustness. Um, and, and I just tend to, or I've seemed to be able to do that um, across different levels and different sports. And, um, and I'll be honest, it's really the same philosophy. It's really, you know, my base training menu has always been the same. It's just you, you change it by five or 10% specific to the context and, and it seems to apply. So that's me. Ah, oh, cool. Matt? Um, very similar start to Jonas, rugby player, and um, sort of that transitioned into just an interest in SNC and um, fitness and speed and power and all those things. And um, probably from there, um, again, same as Jonas, realized that didn't quite have the answers or probably had more, a gain more of an interest in speed and realized that I needed to go to someone who had the answers and um, quite a lot of testing and podcast later I ended up with a internship with Jonas and then um things have just gone from there really now we can't get rid of you <laughs> <laughs> well that's kind of the theme with our interns like we have lots of people apply each year from from home and away and like abroad and um we've been lucky to take on over the past six or seven years some really great minds um some really good practitioners who have only I've, only, I've been quite selfish with our internship. I've only taken on interns that can add value to what we're doing here. Um, people don't just come to make coffees and pick up cones. They, they really have to come with a skill set um, and, a, and a character uh, that is going to add to our environment. Um, our, our athletes are very susceptible to the people in their environment. And it's almost like if, if you bring in the wrong type of person, you, you actually really... Um, decrease the quality of of communication and, and comfort and and all the important things necessary for the athletes to feel at home um, on a daily basis. Um, so we've we've had some really good interns over the past six or seven years, and, and 
and um, you know they've gone on to work for the RFU, for the FA, for for the LTA. They've gone on to work for Chinese um, athletic uh, or Olympic uh, committee. Um, so we have some really really good guys, and, and Matt's Matt's our most recent, um, who is uh, working closely with me with some of our rugby projects. Awesome. I think it is that you know when you mentioned there about the interns coming in, it's got to be creating part of that culture rather than you know just coming in and not really not really adding anything to it you know you want to keep that um good culture that you've created anyway yeah for sure and, and you know the internship you know uh, there's a bit of a you know there's a lot of politics around interns and payment and stuff and you know most of athletics is amateur mm. where we do have um paid work we do offer paid work for the interns but often they're coming and they are investing time and energy into being here. So we have to make sure that one, we get something out of that, but also they get something out of it also. Yeah. Uh, so if you just turn up and you spend, you know, our internship is often 10 months. If you just came here and spent all of that time watching and, and carrying cones and, um, and doing medial tasks, then it's not really worthwhile. Whereas these guys, they come, I recognize their skill sets. I, I, they watch for maybe six weeks and then I'll put them to work. Um, they take responsibility and, and they, they have to live the highs and the lows if, if they do well um, and then they, they get the plaudits and if they cock it up, then, then they get the, the <laughs> they have to take responsibility as well. So yeah. um, I think what, what we, we often find is that the interns um, end up um, having a massive jump in reality checks. Um, what, what works, what doesn't work in this environment, you really see it straight away. It's not just the trust the process thing. Like we, we see peak power change we see um athlete uh, work capacity change we see technical efficiency change um very quickly depending on what they're doing and how they're doing it so it really is a, an accountable environment where I, I feel like the guys come into it um and in, in one place and leave like you know iphone iphone 11 you know they come in as an iphone 7 or an android and they leave as an iphone 11 <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And I think that's how it should be with, with interns, because I think sometimes I know for me, you know, the short lived sort of internships that, that I did with um, Yorkshire Carnegie and Bradford, to be honest, I got you, I got bored of just not doing it. I wasn't learning anything. But uh, I know from what Matt has, Matt has mentioned that, you know, he's learned quite a lot from from working with yourself. Um, just touching on that, Matt, how do you think you've um, developed as a coach with you know, being in that type of environment and surrounded by that um, culture, how have you developed as a as a coach? Do you think? Uh, well, I think the the first and, and foremost thing is just being in that environment, being being at Loughborough University, which comes with probably a a bit of a rap in itself. Um, but then just being surrounded by some of the athletes that that maybe you've watched on TV maybe and 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 all those kind of things it's quite a humbling environment and and straight away it kind of it it kind of brings you back down to earth a little bit and that um you maybe go there thinking that you know a little bit and really you don't know anything at all um and it just develops from there i think probably the biggest thing that i've come out with is you've got to have quite a lot of strings to your bows um i went there as thinking that i would maybe just do a little bit of SNC and and see what Jonas did in terms of programming wise for SNC and ended up running the SNC for for two guys and and picking up lots off the therapist and things like that I think you just end up with loads of spring strings to your bow and um, so that would be my that would be my biggest thing yeah nice so you've both mentioned there as well, you know, with your with your backgrounds, um, working with uh, different athletes. You've mentioned there rugby, but also track and field. Uh, and Matt, you've mentioned there because um, I know you've done your uh, therapy course as well. You know, adding a couple more strings to your bow. Um, and when the sort of the phrase strength conditioning coach comes out, comes around, you sort of think, oh well, they'll just be assigned to one team and they'll just work with that one team. What does you know an average day look like for the for the, for, for you guys? Because you know I, I know you work with quite a broad range of athletes in different sports. What would a what would a normal day sort of look like? Um, <clears throat> for me, uh, it, it depends on which day, but like a, no a normal main training day um, could start in the morning with someone who's not even in my squad. I, I could have a player um, or an athlete who is rehabbing who will take one of my client slots in the early morning. 
Um, and so I'll, I'll come to the track early, maybe 7, 7.30 start. Um, and, and we'll go through whatever they need to go through. And, and like you say, in this environment, it's very difficult to separate um, training and practitioners that are here for health or for performance. Because often um, the, 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 line, the line that we're trying to take these guys to um, of peak performance often ask questions of their body. So it doesn't mean that they're injured, but it just might mean that they need to take a step back. And what I found in my work of team sports, um, I've, I've been a consultant for Derby County for a number of years and, and a few other teams. And, and, and then you get a few agents and get a few players who, who seem to know you. Um, what generally happens is when players are deep into the season and they're a bit niggly, but they, they want to keep playing, then they come to us. And we, 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 do, we do some extra bits with them. And so in, early in the morning, we might have a rehab hour. We might have someone who's working on something. By 9.30, 9.45, my squad will come in and we'll spend the next two to three hours on the track, warming up, doing some trackside therapy, doing some specific strength um, and, and essentially sprinting. Um, and then they will have a two-hour break between their track and their gym session. In that break, I may see another client or I may, I may do a review of the training session. Um, and then we're in the gym, we're in the gym for at this time of the year, maybe for 90 minutes. Um, and again, we'll, we'll go through some uh, you know, compound lifts, maybe some Olympic derivatives and, and, and then quite a lot of ex accessory lifts. Um, and so that's, that's a normal training day here. But then uh, uh, in between those days, uh, especially on an active recovery day, I, I, may, I may be at, um, with England during the Six Nations or if it's at Autumn Internationals, um, or I may be with Derby County um, or maybe like next week when I'm traveling to see a, a, another premiership rugby club. Um, so it, it kind of depends for me in the week but it alternates between either being based in the high pack here in Loughborough all day, maybe from seven till seven sometimes, um, or being on the road, um, seeing, seeing clubs or seeing, seeing other uh, consultants. Okay. Uh, and, and Matt, what, what sort of, what's your um, average day sort of looking like? Because I know obviously um, with, with me and you working in the, in the same gym as well, you've got, um, you still have your base, but I know you can be out and about quite a lot. Yeah, so obviously my base is, is Primal Gym where um, I'm probably in a bit of a, of a transition where I'm hopefully or trying to make my day look a bit more like Jonas's in terms of um, I'm still transitioning from having some general pop stuff going on. Um, but at the same time, I've also got my own little athlete group that um, various different sports from lacrosse and netball and all those kind of stuff. So some of those guys see me from three to one to three times a week depending on um where they are in the season and what their budget is and and all those kind of things um and and that, even their work schedules and stuff like that um and then alongside that i've trying to sort of build up some a place and a home for um athletes in the north of england to to come and see come and see me for um speed and movement and and rehab and stuff like that um, so that's that's a growing growing thing and and it's progressing nicely, um, and then alongside that I have um, obviously something that's developed through Jonas as consulting for Newcastle Falcons as well, which is that those guys are doing really well this season and um, they're unbeaten this year. Obviously they've gone down last year, so um, hopefully they'll progress to back up to the Premiership and and we can kind of continue working together. Nice. So you both mentioned there, you know, you, you'll work with quite a number of people. Do you find it quite hard um, to transition from uh, different, working with different athletes? Or um, I suppose I know as well, you know, touching on that as well, Matt, you're training athletes and general population. So do you, or do you all have, do you both have your um, templates or principles that you both follow? Um, is it hard to work with different athletes? No. No, I think the, the difficulty is when you are working with, um, okay, so, so, so sometimes if, even if it's just my boys and my girls, watching very fast boys who can run 11.5 metres per second and then watching very high world-class females who are running 10 metres per second, 10.5 metres per second, can actually be a bit of a mind scramble because what you get used to seeing at high speed even though it's extremely elite for the females, um, is, is actually a lot slower. So, you, so actually the, the, the mindset and my coaching eye and my ability to um, assess and correct in the moment 
is always challenged when I'm moving between that. And that same thing happens when you move from elite females to, let's say, a centre-back who may not be able to run faster than 9.5 metres per second, but it's playing for a premiership team, you know? So I, I think the, the reality is that as long as you have a clear outline of what, what you think efficient and effective movement should look like and the bandwidth of that, because no one's going to be the same, but everyone, but, but you can still assess people to understand if they're um, efficient or not. Um, if you have your uh, a consistent training menu that, um, that you know has good correlates with certain elements of performance and, and then just ability to create relationships because that's the, that's the biggest deal is that sometimes I have people come into this environment that are closer to general prop and they are um, overwhelmed and, and, and are excited to be around elite athletes. They might see an England rugby player or a premiership football player or, or Reese Prescott, you know, a sub-10 runner. And, and it's just being able to make them feel like they belong. Um, let them know that this is their home too um, and being able to you know chat and, and get them to buy into what we're doing so um, I think at the end of the day as long as you're working with humans humans are humans right um, and so it's it's that that's the element that you need to work on if you want to be able to engage different populations yeah I think that's a, a good a good way of looking at it because you know coming down to it just like you say it comes down to coaching and building relationships you don't have to um, be you know maybe over technical or you know just have that separation and um, you obviously you want to get the best out of your athletes so it does come down to building that relationship mm. uh, Matt yeah I think your relationship point is the key point um, I, I I've now got the challenge of that I've got a group of athletes that have been working with me a long time um, and I've probably got the things knuckled down in that I know what works for that person and because I've worked with them for so long but now I'm getting to the point where I'm actually now getting some people in and they're having their first session with me and you have to work them out really quickly you have to work them out really quickly so that you can make um some nice changes to them immediately and they get some buy-in straight away um but also give them enough that they can take away so that they can practice on their own because they might not be able to see you for another month or another couple of months um and it's finding the right language to for someone who's just got an hour with you and they're seeing you for the first time versus the language that you might use for the people that you've been working with for two or three years um, and, and, and that's probably the challenge that I'm in now um, which is a fun one yeah, you know, it keeps you it keeps you on your toes, and I suppose that's why you know you keep involved in uh, in coaching because there's always new challenges out there. Um, just sort of diving into that one, um, the, that point a little bit more. Obviously, you mentioned there, Matt, that you might have some people for um, meeting them for the first time, and it's how you change. And sometimes, when you mentioned Jonas, that you might be um, going up and doing some consulting with teams. If you have a limited amount of time with um, the uh, with the athlete or the teams that you're working with how do you sort of get to that point where you know the athlete is going to take something away from them so they can practice on is there a, a, a bank of exercises that you use or um, how would you go about that to, to make sure that in that session or that time that you spend with that athlete or that team that they actually take something away from it if you do have limited time I think <clears throat> I think sometimes they don't take something away from it you know sometimes I have before training with, with England, maybe I might, I might get 16 minutes. If, if I'm lucky, I might get 12. And right there and then, I'm, I'm told that Eddie wants them to be able to be able to run very fast as soon as they come out of, my, out of my session. They need to be able to do some kick chase or they need to be able to do some aggressive decel type drill. Um, sorry, aggressive um, defense type drill. And uh, so what I need them to take away is probably not really a learning point or teaching point I need to make sure that they've got good co-contractions around their tendons that they're very happy to be elastic at their ankles and their hips um, and their lumbar pelvic disassociation is all switched on and 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 essentially they are physically prepared to run fast and we are limiting um, or we, we are increasing their uh, yeah I wouldn't say limiting injury but it's, it's difficult to say that as a phrase so maybe maybe more like I'm preparing them in the best way for them to perform at a high intensity um, so during those sessions, there, there is no real 
teaching point beyond make them feel fast, make them look fast and, 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 and just activate them. Um, but what I may get is uh, a section after training with critical players who have important work-ons. Um, it, it might be that in, in close quarters, they're very good at stepping off their right side, but when, once they get onto their left, they don't re-accelerate. So it's, it's a step and then a dead type step. You know, so a step to off the right and then uh, it's almost a stall. And so, you know, that might be highlighted as a critical component for them in, in uh, attacking situations. So I'll go away and work on it. And so that, that my work on that, that I wanted them to take away, well, that was already prescribed to me by the coach or by the player. If they've come to me and say, OK, well, essentially in, in, in attacking situations, I'm really good at taking it up route one, but I, I, you know, I've been told that I need to act on footwork just before contact. OK, well, now I've got a key work on. Um, so, you know, it always comes from the coach most of the time in my, in my field, if I'm in a team sport environment. Now, if I'm in my environment here and the players are coming to me, well, my work-ons are always going to revolve around being able to project yourself, be reactive for your ankles and switch and essentially switches to have an effective limb exchange. Um, and so when people come here, we're always going to work on those, but at what intensity and which one is the priority? That will just depend on where they are in their learning cycle, where they are in the training week. If, if they come to me a bit fatigued, it's going to limit what some of the things I can do. I can still teach, but it's going to limit what I teach and how. If they come to me with an injury or niggle, um, then it's going to just shift me maybe to the side. And in terms of my training menu, I might not do the fruit of the tree. Uh, so training specificity, we always talk about the fact that real, real specific events, real specific activities to... to specific to your competition event what I would call the fruit you know so right it's right at the edge whereas the the, the trunk and and the roots are going to be very general activities and, and everything in between like the branches are kind of connecting activities so people talk about primary secondary tertiary transfer or people talk about um, different levels in the bond the chuck pyramid um, but a real simple analogy is, is about the fruit so when the guys come to me if they're broken they're tired or they're very unfamiliar, so I want to be safe, um, then we're not going to do the fruit as much. We might do a branch. It might feel like acceleration. It might feel like speed, but I'm going to limit the intensity by resisting it um, or by making it more drill format. Um, whereas if they come to me fresh and they're ready to go, then we're going to, we're going to increase the intensity. But essentially, it's always, it's always going to come down to acceleration, deceleration, change direction, or maximum speed. Um, and, and how we filter... Um, up and down, the specificity will depend on the readiness and, and uh, the readiness of the athlete. So you mentioned there, obviously, within your environment, obviously just, just mentioned um, that you might change the training. When it comes to working with uh, England, and uh, it's obviously dictated by what you know Eddie Jones is, uh, is potentially asking of you, is, was there ever, or is there ever a position where you um, put your own thoughts of it or when you think sometimes actually... Um, something else might be needed or um, is well, it yeah I think like, coaches will tell you what they want at the end uh, right. uh, most respectful coaches will tell you what they want at the end they won't tell you how to get there right. um, they'll what they want at the end and then you have to choose what's appropriate on the day and what you might have done last week to get them there is, is maybe very different to what you do this week you know if it's a short turnaround between games um, if you know if if you're a football team and you play on you play on Saturday then you've got a Wednesday then a Saturday game but you still need to get ready for a Wednesday, you know your your match day plus two you, you still may need to activate you still may to do may need to do the same kind of things but yeah you need to choose uh, a exercise selection that um, reduces risk and maximizes your your reward. Um, so by all means at, at the end of the day you've got to play. At the end of the day, you've got to train, no matter what. If you're niggly or not, well, if you're half niggly, if you're tired, if you're ready to train, you have to train. Like that's our role. We've got to get them ready. So it's it's our choice if we uh, if we choose an intense, a less intense, or a real um, you know tertiary version to get them ready. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and and Matt, on the on the flip side of that, obviously you mentioned there that um, you wanted your athletes to take something away from the sessions and um, do you have a different spin on that or what, what are your thoughts yeah i think it just comes down to the amount of uh, of time and and what the kind of look luxuries as it were that you've got um you know if you are seeing someone that potentially maybe is just coming in to see you 
for an, an hour, an hour and a half, and you're probably not going to see them again for potentially another month. You, you need to probably give them a hit of something. You need some something in there specific. It might be your resisted runs. It might be actually you just run them really fast. Um, and you, you're essentially giving them that, you're opening them up for the, the opportunity to do that. Um, it might be that, <laughs> you know, I might get someone that is actually coming in to train with me on an evening, but they're going off to play and going off to play netball in the evening. Uh, and they've got half an hour with me. How I choose to do that half an hour, well, it's probably not going to be making them tired and, and beating them up. It's actually, I probably just need to change what I'm needing to do and maybe just giving them some activation and opening up their hips a little bit and just switching their nervous system on a little bit so they're ready. And that's maybe where you, where you go in the time that you've got. So I think, yeah, I, I can't add anything more than what Jonas has said. I think it just depends on the time that you've got. and and then. Having that exercise and, and training template menu that um, essentially you can pick off and pick and choose um, what's the right dose at the right time. Yeah. So the the few chats that we've had there, um, quite similar takes on things. Um, so I'm going to throw something else into the pot and let's see if uh, let's see if there's anything that um, you two may may differ on. So obviously, as a as consultants and going out and working with these teams. Um, Obviously, you're going to put your own your own spin and your own take on it. But what are your what are both your thoughts on potentially things that aren't as good in the in the speed world and the uh, the information that's put out there, or what coaches are potentially delivering that is that is different to you? And what is um, the best practices that that you've seen, which is which is good? Because I think sometimes. Um, if you're going in as as a, as a consultant and you have that external eye, you can maybe pick up on things on on things a little bit more. Um, so I'll leave it open. Whoever wants to go first, what are your thoughts on sort of the good and good and bad that you see in the in the speed world? The, the good, the bad, and the ugly of speed training. Oh, I don't know. Um, I think um, let's talk of just of training in general. So you talked about being an SNC coach. I. Uh, I started as quote unquote snc coach and then i started then i thought i'd be a speed coach and often people refer to me as a speed coach but i spend just as much time in medical um in the medical world uh, working with physios working with running rehabbers long-term rehabbers um as i do working for performance sport um and i spend a lot of time consulting and doing coach education with SNC coaches and fitness coaches and the problem is that most of them most of employment in this country is based on having a UK SCA accreditation and, and your degree um, whereas and, and that's fine but what ends up happening is that Olympic lifts and squatting and lunging and essentially what people call fundamental movements are at the top of the performance measurement tree like if if you can do all these things well i've done my job as an snc coach whereas my perspective and what i always try to push people to, to do is again look at bondachuk's uh, classification or just look at any classification look at anything that any player wants what a manager wants and what's necessary to create robustness and work capacity in the sport and it's going to be related to running um jumping change of direction deceleration um, it's going to be based on manipulating your trunk and your spine um, at speed so you can reorientate your, your body wherever it is you're trying to go or not go. And, and that's the top of the paradigm. That's the fruit of the tree. That's where we should be focused on our assessment. And that's where um, effective practitioners should be measured. But it's not. So they're, they're not measured on that. Um, the, but essentially, we know that's the, the critical limiting factor for most performances so i think that the problem with speed is that it's put in a separate category to physical performance um the, the problem with speed training in the world is that um it's not people's fault it's that it's difficult to see that's maybe the biggest problem is that most of my life i've spent filtering out bs and filtering out lots of different fads to just come to my simple philosophy and actually my simple philosophy seems to cross over to so many different realms that I think it's effective. Um, and why is it effective? Why, why, do, why does coach education 
um, it, why is that a big business for me? Well, it was because actually we, we simplified the complex and make, make people just realize that it's not that difficult, that you add some rationale, you add some um, rational thinking, um, and you just need to know a bit of anatomy and physiology. You just need to know a bit. Oh, is it speeding up? Sorry, I think that's something with the recording. Um, essentially, what's wrong with the speed? I mean, let me rephrase the answer there. So what's wrong with speed is that people think it's different to, to, to performance, whereas actually there is a massive connect between the two. Um, and health and speed and acceleration and power and plyometrics all connect. Um, and seeing it through a different lens is, is I think, the, the strength of what we do um, and the good practitioners out there. Just keep it simple um, and make it easy for people to understand. Do you think, just, just sort of on a, on a bit of a tangent there, that in terms of um, the, the, when the information and the, uh, on, the, on, on sprint training, on, on speed is put out there, that you know, some of the um, uh, more well-known coaches, an example is I had a, um, a podcast with Mike Boyle, um, and the, you know, we touched on the, um, uh, on the point of, of speed, and he, you know, mentioned that it was just sort of, you know, repeated, repeated sprints. That's, that's all you need to do. And obviously you mentioned there that, you know, you need to simplify things a little bit. Has he gone the other way of simplifying it too much that he thinks that there's nothing else to it? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that was going to be my, to be fair, that was going to be my sort of point was that I think there's as much as, there's a few people out there that are making speed popular, which I think is a great thing. Um, and probably prioritizing speed and, and movement over um, lifting numbers and, and things like that. I think their, the complexities of speed can't be just broken down to, well, we'll just run you through some gates yeah. and we'll just run you through some gates and we'll just run you through some gates. Um, I think there's a little bit more to it than that. Um, and by all means, I think there's, there's definitely a place for it, for running through gates. I think you need to see that you're getting results and your program's working. Um, but at the same time, I feel that um, there's probably a little bit too much of a, maybe something, maybe pressure being placed on just, just timing, and just timing over and over again. I think what, you're sort of, what they're sort of saying is that, you know, would you do a one rep max squat without going in and doing some technical work before uh, and building up to that? Um, I don't think you would. Yeah. So I think there's got to be a place for other things um, to build speed other than just going through gates. I mean, I just look at the, the rationale for some people, some clubs, some practitioners who don't, who, who don't, practice speed or, or you know t teaching or ingraining good running mechanics um or exposing athletes to good intensity you know however you want to put it um most of it is because they're scared of getting broken most yeah. of it is because they've had bad experiences of athletes getting hurt um and so uh because they're because they don't understand it they'd rather avoid it and actually maybe that is a good strategy if if your one priority is not breaking athletes Whereas, you know, if you, if you come across good coaches and managers and good players who want to be better and want to be faster, who rely on players being faster um, and that new speed transferring to their game, then they're going to encourage you to do so. Um, and if all you do is make excuses um, or just have one way of training that component, then you're going to get lost and you're going to get found out. Yeah. So I, I think I, when I say to simplify it, just to clarify, I think it's important to understand what you should be seeing. It's just important to have umbrella terms and, and just KPIs for what effective movement is in acceleration, in upright running, in change of direction. I think it's important to be able to summarize those key movement patterns and then reverse engineer um, all your exercises and your exercise inventory to be able to target those critical movement patterns but the way you train them in running conditioning and in in speed specific work is very varied and just as many 
just as just as we say projection reaction switching and um, those being three key components you may say acceleration if we're just talking about straight line running you may say acceleration speed and work capacity are your three components and even within those three components you could probably break them down and find different ways to overload and underload each of those components so to so you can have a different target so the, uh, the training menu from exercise selection um perspective is mirrored in the training menu for um for physiological or for energy system development so by all means repeat the speed is, is one in the spectrum um but running a bit slower and doing more volume or running a bit faster and doing less volume you know like all things there is a bandwidth to everything yeah yeah and as well you know a little bit like what matt was saying about the about the squat you know that you've got to work on a little bit of technique and you know it's a it's a skill in what in, in whatever you're doing and um, yeah why i wanted to just touch on that was you know that there are there is information being put out there, but not necessarily. Uh, I think people can be like, "Oh, well, if if Mike Boyle's doing it, then you know that that, that must be right." Um, just sort of following on from that, what do you think is um, where do you think speed training um, is looking, or how it's going to develop in in the in the future? Do you think you know more people are going to be using the the principles and the templates um, that, that that you both have? Uh, what do you think the the future holds for that? Um, I think the future is bright most of the time, at least, you know, we, we run a number of workshops across multiple sports and, um, what's always empowering or no, what's always exciting is that the individuals that turn up aren't fresh. So maybe five years ago, you know, running my first, my first workshops or six years ago, you know, Franz Bosch and Ben Rosenblatt, and I had some really good key speakers and, uh, it, it felt like some of our the people that were turning on, even though they were employed by governing bodies or professional teams, were found the concepts very foreign. But I think I feel like now it's the other way around, where a lot of a lot of the basic concepts seem to be quite well digested by the population. You can see that well well digested because people are putting their own spin on it, specific to their environment. That's what you always want to see. Um, so I think actually there is far more acceptance. Um, you know, Tim Gabbett and his speed vaccine, everyone's making sense of it now and kind of saying, okay, well, I was scared of speed, but okay, may maybe if I do a bit more, you know, maybe if I expose some of these guys to two or three fast sprints away without the ball um, during the game week, that, that actually maybe it will be helpful. Um, and I think, uh, look, eccentric training has been around since since forever. But again, it's come back into fashion, Nordics or yo-yos or or whatever it is that people are using. And again, I think they they all add towards um, supporting this whole speed menu. Um, so I, I'm I'm quite optimistic about it all. Um, I I did a, a workshop or I was involved in a workshop of the FA um, two weeks ago, and that that's probably one of the most enjoyable workshops I've, I've done because I learned as much. Um, as as I taught, um, and and so what, what's nice to see is that really smart practitioners, the right guys are, are, and the right girls are, are getting important roles and are able to influence their sporting culture, and that's what I think is happening in the FA at the moment. That you know some really smart brains from different sports who have built a really good team mentality within their own um, within their own team and are, are and I've spent some quality time spent maybe up to two years really thinking about what really matters how they're going to really influence their players their the coaches and the teams um, and are, are being smart with how they provide that information but essentially are teaching people how to be proud and how to easily develop their running mechanics their running speed and, and maximise its transfer to the game. So I, I think positive things are happening um, as we speak. Oh, nice. Uh, Matt, is there anything um, that you wanted to comment on that? What, what are your yeah. thoughts? Yeah, I, w I would agree massively. I think um, if, you, if you look a a around, I mean, I, I guess it always depends a little bit on, on who you follow, but if you look around social media at the moment, um, you know, you've got guys like Tony Holler and Chris Corfis that are, uh, track and field consortium and um, you've got um, Jonas here doing speed works and um, you've got the C-VASPs and, and all those kind of things 
speed is starting to become a popular subject, I think, rather than lifting weights. Um, and by all means, lifting weights has its place. But um, I think th- there is a starting to be a, a bit more of an understanding and a bit more of just generally just more of a popular topic and interest um, in speed. And I think that can only be a positive thing because um, it pressures people into knowing more about speed and movement and rehab and all those kind of things and um, bringing those two, three things together um, to help performance and health. Yeah, oh, cool. Uh, I think, I think, I think sorry, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut you off because Matt Matt underplays some of the work he's doing with Newcastle Falcons, and I, I think what what you see at the moment, and and I, I've experienced it a lot, but it's been behind closed closed doors, and I think now some of it's coming a bit more out in the open. But what you're seeing, what I see at the moment, and the work that Matt's done with Newcastle is quite interesting because you you know he what he's done there is he's gone in, he spent the preseason working on just the basic speed, just ba- basic fundamentals of acceleration, and be- being elastic, be- being prepared for the floor and-, and what it means to create robustness in those positions. And that's great. And that's the first step. That's your ABCs. Just learn, learn the ABCs. And then what- what's actually happened is uh, more of a understanding of what the coach wants, what the skills coach wants, what, what, are, the- what are the key things they're doing in training, what happens when they don't do speed for a number of weeks, you know what? What what detracts from performance? What uh, what's the coach's feedback? Not not Matt's feedback. What are the coaches saying they're seeing? What does the what does GPS say? Um, how do they want to play? What are the critical areas they want to play in? And how do we take the ABCs and start to formulate them into sentences? How do we take the ABCs and start to create more specific drills that actually have more relevance to what? is going to make the boat go faster on, on game day? What's going to actually make players feel faster, do things more efficiently that are specific to the game? Um, and having a good relationship with, across the board with staff is, is important to do that. And um, that, that's, that's where I think speed coaches have the most value in teams. It's not just how fast can we go um, in a straight line what does GPS say? It's not just what does our kineogram look like when we're running over wickets? Um, can we have front side mechanics? It's, it's not just are we looking pretty? It's are we effective? Can we do our task better? And yes, straight line speed is uh, an important component of that, uh, you know, because it's essentially speed reserve and uh, that's, that concept is widely accepted. Um, but now it's more, okay, how, how do we make sure that what we're doing can easily turn into what really matters on game day. Um, and so that's, that's where I think the evolution of speed coaches is, is it's not just straight line running, but is affecting performance at a, at, at a technical level. I think that was, I think that's quite a nice way to um, sort of round, round off the, the podcast really. The you know, whole point of the podcast is to um, point people in the direction um, to make sure that they're getting more better quality content and information out there. Um, because I know sometimes, you know, I mentioned about the uh, repeated sprints with, with Mike Boyle um, to expose the, the listeners to coaches such as yourselves to see that, you know, there is actually more, uh, more to it than that and you know there's a whole host of other elements that people need to to think about um from what we've from what we've chatted today um what would be your sort of uh, for both of you what would be your sort of take home points or or words and w- or words of wisdom um for for everyone listening i'll let you go first on that <laughs> oh um uh words of wisdom take home points um look look at Look at performance as as a one as one. Yeah, every every hamstring that needs to be rehabbed or ankle that needs to be rehabbed. What are the exercises needed there that get the hamstring or ankle back? And actually, let's forget them as rehab based exercises. Instead, where where do we see them on our training paradigm, on our on our on our training menu, and and our level of specificity? Um, because if you can connect that those two paradigms, then you've done a good job. Then if you look at performance uh, at, at the fruit. If you look at the game day performance, how do we connect um, our, our speed work, our specific work to that? And, and how do we just create one training menu that, that attaches them all? I think if, if, if coaches work towards that as a goal, then they're going to be doing um, more effective work, more efficient work, and, and are going to have happy and healthy players. Nice. 
Matt, have you thought of one yet? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would say like um, maybe um, maybe it sounds a bit cheesy, but um, like a couple of years ago, I wouldn't have thought I would be sat here having this conversation with you and Jonas. So um, I would say seek people out that are a bit cleverer than you um, and um, can have a uh, an impact in your career. And 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 I think you'll you'll go forward from there. Nice. Um, thanks a lot for both of you for taking the time to chat with me. For everyone listening, because I know you've you know mentioned seminars and you know you're working with athletes coming to see you anyway. Just for everyone listening who might want to either have a few more questions on the topics that we've chatted about today, or maybe even reach out and get involved in coaching with you, or or whatever it may be. Just want to uh, let people know where they can find you or get in touch with you. Yeah, so we- our website is speedworks dot training. Um, and I'm eat, sleep, train underscore on most social medias, Twitter and Instagram. So, um, yeah, really easy to find. Send me a DM. Always happy to chat. Nice. Yeah, I'm uh, Matt Cook Coaching on Instagram and Twitter and, and Facebook and stuff. So, um, yeah, same thing. Um, by all means, uh, message and, message and get, in, get in touch. Spot on. Uh, for everyone listening, 100% check out the work that you know Jonas and Matt, Matt do. Um, it is really, really interesting. Um, I know, obviously, we, we're working with Matt and um, what, how he um, mentions how, what he's learned, but also how he's developed as a coach. Um, I know it's helped me as well and, and made me think a little bit more. Um, so thanks a lot, Jonas and Matt, for taking the time to chat with me. Thanks a lot to everyone listening, and I will see you all next week. Thanks a lot for having us. Thank you.